I'm really, really happy to be moderating Nanjala's book launch for the second time. I moderated her, the launch of her first book in 2018, and she gave me the honor to do it again. The first sentence in this book is, this is not a travel memoir. We called it Traveling While Black because Traveling While Black is the title of one of the essays, and we thought it was one of the most um, powerful titles um, of all of the essays, um, at least in a way that would make sense to a broad range of audiences. So some of the essays are about travel, but really more broadly it's about human mobility and how people move and how I have moved through the world. I'm on page 106 and Nanjala is talking about uh, Alice Walker going to kind of unearth uh, Zora Neale Hurston and her legacy and how she had been forgotten, lost to the, you know, the winds of time. After the 2017 election, which was a huge punch in the gut for a lot of people in this country and certainly for me, I wanted to go and do something for myself. And the great joy of writing is if someone gives you money to do something that you're passionate about, which doesn't always happen. Sometimes you have the money, sometimes you have the passion, but in those rare instances where you get both, it's just wonderful. I had been trying to get someone to, to commission me to write an essay about Bessie Head for a long time, for almost four years, um, because I just, I loved her writing so much. An African woman writer who is writing from a really remote rural part of Botswana and is not writing in a way that people consider quote unquote African, as a chapter in the, in the essay, had become so important to me in terms of my sense of self, in terms of my, my orientation as a writer. Um, and Angela writes this, in Hurston, Walker found what all writers know to be true, and certainly what I'm now finding to be true of head. Fame in writing almost never translates into material wealth, and your favorite writer is often one tragedy or one mishap away from dying penniless and getting lost in the annals of time. I've seen things that I wish I could unsee. <laughs> Just in this frustration of wanting things to be different and wanting the things that you do to matter and facing up to the limitations of doing things that stick. And also seeing in lines of fracture that scare you because you know what happens in other places when those lines end here, when those lines of fracture become deep. So I haven't quite figured it out either. I think what I've gathered from the readings that I've done and you know from passing through this work with this essay is you don't really figure it out, you just learn how to live with it. And that's why I have that line, you know, she was Sisyphus with the weight of the world on her shoulders because I had this vision. When you read Bessie Head's letters, you see a person who was constantly burdened. It just, it's like, a, it becomes like a dull pain that is just constantly present and it doesn't heal or go away. You just kind of get used to carrying it. That's so depressing. Um, life is great, hey. <laughs> Writing for me is a way of processing the world. It's a way of making sense of things. And I had been going back and forth about writing this essay for many years because what ended up happening was someone that I, I love intervened on my behalf. But at the same time, it was just like, people don't realize how arbitrary and cruel these decisions can be and how much of an impact they have on people's lives and sense of worth. I was of the last generation that had to sleep outside the UK embassy to apply for a student visa. I don't know how many people remember this. We used to sleep, on, uh, you know, in Upper Hill, where the High Commission is. We used to get there at three in the morning because they only used to take the first 30 applicants. So as student visas became more in demand, people used to sleep in the road overnight. My first UK student visa, that's how, I, that's how we got it. We're there at three in the morning and you had to sleep in the road. There is something about the insidious ways in which we load up these bureaucracies with our structural, with structural violences and structural judgments that I think we need to stop everything in its tracks. And so the hope of this essay is that ordinary people 
people who are not in policy positions, people who are not experts, people who are not insiders, start to ask these questions and start to think, am I playing along with this trap? Am I going along with this setup? Do I have power to make a difference in this context? Do we have power to do something differently? And I don't know if we do, but I certainly hope that I've started off the process of people feeling like there's something more here, this Leviathan is here, and it's more than just, it's just the process. If we don't deal with the ugliness, we do it again. And look at the cycles that we're in. 10 year cycle right now, five year cycles. If we don't get real about the ugliness, there's no way of dealing with it. It just becomes something else that unspoken harms. And the essay that I write about, um, this is for the community, that was part of the thing was that there's so many silences about the relationship between the Asian community and the black community in Kenya. And there's so much unspoken violence that I think people tiptoe around. And so you're dealing with harms and you're carrying baggage that you can't even articulate publicly. How do you heal? How? The point that I made in the book was, you know, the first political assassination in Kenya was of an Asian man, Pio Gamma Pinto, 1965. And it had consequences. It had a ripple effect in the public consciousness. And there are kids who go to school in Kenya who don't know who Pio Gamma Pinto is. I have no idea. The kids who don't know who Makam Singh is. It's just this structural silence that makes so much of who we think we are an illusion. And so that is really it for me. Like, the point of writing is to help people have an honest encounter with themselves and with the world.